Well, amen, church. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Do you have a lot to be thankful for? Amen. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people and he calls our heart towards thanksgiving. It's what he desires and requires from us for us to be thankful and he will save the day. Check it out. Psalm 50 for us to be thankful and he will save the day. All right. Do me a favor and turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter six. Revelation chapter 6, and some of you are already licking your chops. You're saying we are preaching out of the book of Revelation today. This is too exciting. You can't stand it. Calm down just a little bit. We do have a uniqueness of the sermon today, okay? I'm going to do something that I do not typically do. It's, it's going to be quite topical, but... We will have a passage. We will jump out of that because I want to ask the question, a unique question this morning. What is the state of the church? Both nationally, certain trends, and internationally. So you can pray for me here in a moment. We're going to be looking at charts and graphs. There's going to be a factual movement to the sermon, but then... We never want to stay factual. We want to press into important truths that we know and understand from God's word. Secondly, as I read out of the book of Revelation 6 and 7, I'm going to expound it for a brief moment. I'm going to give a quick overview. And I know that the book of Revelation is a hotly debated book and that some of you Uh, may want to send me emails about my interpretation of this section. Uh, And and if there's one thing I've learned about the church, that is that you want to get the people riled up, start talking about the book of Revelation. Um, Primarily, when, when people do not hear their specific interpretation of the book of Revelation, they can't hear the rest of the sermon. So this whole precursor is just to invite you, okay? I'm going to give a solid historical understanding of the book here. I don't want you looking for what did he do wrong, but rather I just want you to be able to hear me, okay? So that we can understand some solid truths and then ask this very large question about the state of the church, Okay, all that to say, even before we read it, let's just pause for a moment and pray. Would you spend a few moments and would you pray for me specifically as I wage through some graphs and charts and to be able to preach God's word with clarity? Would you pray for your own heart and mind? You pray for the Lord to speak to you. Father, we love you. We are not worthy of your goodness and your kindness, and yet you pursue us and you freely give it to us. Your mercy and your grace are far beyond comprehension. In fact, all of eternity will be the unfolding of your goodness. And we praise you. We thank you for your word. We press into it right now. We ask for you to speak to us. We ask for you to change our hearts and our minds. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, listen as I read Revelation uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as a... Uh, As with a voice of thunder, come. I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come. And another, a red horse came out and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men would slay one another and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come. 
I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying a quart uh, of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice uh, of the fourth living creature saying, come. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and he who sat on it had the name death and Hades was followed with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with famine and with pestilence and with the wild beasts of the earth. The vision has been building all the way back in chapter four. John has been exiled on the island of Patmos, but in God's sovereignty, he has allowed him to experience what, what we would call an apocalyptic vision. He has been ushered up into heaven. And in chapter 4, John gets to see God on his throne. Now, he can't actually see God. He can only see. He begins with the aura around God's throne, and he can only be described in magnificent, brilliant light and color, right? He who dwells in unapproachable light, and then, and then John begins to describe his throne, and he is described as one who sits on a throne filled with beauty and power and wisdom and majesty that no one can comprehend, and there are these creatures, these peculiar creatures to us that are unknown to us, but, but fly and surround the throne and do not cease to cry out day or night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They do not cease to cry out. And John is far removed from this scene. There is a sea, a turbulent sea, that is between him and the image of the throne room of God. And all of this conveys the holiness, the seriousness, the otherness of God. And then in chapter 5, God is seen, same scene, he has a scroll in his right hand as he is seated upon the throne. That scroll represents the unfolding of God's plan for the rest of human history. God's plan for redemption. That God's name will go to the ends of the earth, that restoration and healing will come for all the brokenness that is here, for, for all the evil that exists. It is God's justice. For John, who is exiled on the island of Patmos, inside that scroll is everything his heart longs for. But the charge goes out, and the question is raised, who is able to come and open the scroll because the scroll is sealed with seven seals. Who is able to come and to take the scroll from the king who sits upon his throne from God Almighty and to open it? And John begins to weep because there is no one on the earth, under the earth, or in the heavens who can open the scroll. And John begins to weep uncontrollably. And an angel comes and approaches him and says, stop. Look. And coming from within the throne itself is the lion from the tribe of Judah. And John looks and he sees a lamb as if slain. And the angel says, do not weep. For he is worthy. And all of heaven erupts into praise. They cannot help themselves. They erupt into praise for the lion from the tribe of Judah and the lamb that has been slain, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 6, what I just read is as 
the lamb begins to open each of the seven seals. And we read the first four of them. What we see here is the, the scene as each seal is open, an angel is ushered from the four corners of the earth, and it is pictured metaphorically as one on a white horse, one on a red horse, and a black horse, and a pale horse. And what goes forth with those horse riders, the first one is conquest. That is, that man will fight nation against nation, continuing to conquest. And as conquest happens across the world, well, there will be many, many, many casualties. The second one is war. And for that matter, civil war that happens between tribe and nation. The way that they, there's inner fighting, the way that there's always constant conflict. The third is famine that covers the earth. And the fourth is death, which is a culmination of all of them. But it includes pagues and pestilence. And if you look at verse 8, a fourth of the earth dies with that fourth horse of death. If you want to know, there is an increasing intensity in the book of Revelation, first you have seven seals, and then seven trumpets are blown, and then seven bowls are poured out. In, in the seals, a third of the earth is, is caught up in the tragedy that, that happens. Sorry, a fourth of the earth. In the trumpets, a third of the earth. And in the bowls, the entire earth. All of this symbolizing that there is increasing war and famine and pestilence and turmoil that occurs throughout the earth all the way up until the end. Now, here's the point and why I wanted to jump off of this passage. We should not be surprised by a worldwide pandemic. We should not be surprised by persecution civil or social unrest. Jesus said in Matthew 24, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Listen to me, church. God is in control. He is on his throne the lion from the tribe of Judah is opening the seals of his scroll. His story is being written of ultimate redemption. It will not be thwarted. That is the context by which we must look and ask the question about the state of the church, about what is happening nationally and what is happening internationally. It must be in the context of King Jesus is on his throne and everything is always according to his sovereign plan. Amen. So let's look at a few graphs about what is taking place nationally here in church attendance. This is in the United States. This is a graph that, that spans all the way back from 1993 to, to 2020. Okay, and if you can't quite see the particular details, what you can see with clarity is that the church attendance is, is humming along until about 2009, and then in 2009 to 2020, there's a very dramatic shift that begins to occur. There is a decline. This is overall church attendance. Look at, the, look at this next graph as we look at overall church attendance by generation. Just in case you think that the church is just doing a poor job reaching the younger generation, what you find is that that same period of time, a little after uh, 2009, here in 2012, you see a similar identical uh, drop in church attendance by generation. And it's all generations. Uh, from the back, you, the, the oldest generation and then the, uh, you have elders, boomers, Gen X, and millennials, and all of them have a similar pattern. And let's look at this third graph. Um, this one I want you to pay attention to very closely, because that top blue line, if you're on the far left, that top blue line is practicing Christians. And you see it go along in about the same period of time, 2009, you see this dramatic shift where at the very end, it drops down to 25%. Now, the, uh, the green line is the non-practicing Christians. 
So initially, back in 2000, they are humming along uh, in a similar pattern, but now the highest percentage in the United States is non-practicing Christians. That is people who would just categorically check a box, go, yeah, I'm Christian, but really when you ask them, is there any sort of practice, any sort of church attendance, any sort of meaning to your faith, in reality, it's nah. And then that bottom one, is non-Christians. This would be agnostic, atheist, any other religions, people who, who say, I am not a Jesus Christ follower. So that now at the end of 2020, you have, uh, you have non-practicing Christians, 43%, non-Christians, 32%, and then Christians who are actually practicing their faith, only 25%. Now the question is, is why? Why would we see these trends and what is taking place? I can only give you a quick speculation as far as me, me and my staff have researched this for about a month leading up to this sermon. We've met and we've had talks and tried to sort through and you can't say with any sort of definity with any of these things, but I can tell you two things. One, even before this trend in about 2009, there were indicators that had been coming out for more than 10 years that there was a weakness to genuine faith in America. That numbers were inflated and that categorically we were producing more people who simply so, who did not hold a biblical worldview, but rather saw God as a convenient therapist. When you need God to comfort you, he's there. If you don't want God for anything, that's fine. He can, he can go to the side, go to the closet for as long as you want until you need him, right? I need God right now. He's there to comfort me. If not, he leaves me alone and he allows me to do whatever I want, okay? Theological term called moralistic therapeutic deism, okay? You don't have to remember that. Just there was a weakness within the culture that was talked about before. And the only other explanation that I could say, what would be the catalyst for this? My own personal opinion, I think it has to do with the rise of the internet, smartphones, which ultimately point to social media. Okay? The iPhone came out in 2007. Uh, social media has a massive, massive rise. Our culture becomes very polarized politically and overall the culture does. And what this does more than anything else is it moves the locus of truth to public perception. To public perception. Here's a crazy stat that right now only four out of 10 churchgoers only four out of 10 churchgoers say that the Bible is their source for what is right and wrong. Out of that 25% there at the bottom, only four out of 10 say that the Bible is their source for what is right and wrong. Here's another crazy stat. Of those under 40, among churchgoers, under 40, Christians under 40, they believe more than half, or almost half, sorry, believe that it is wrong to evangelize. Why? Because there's this idea that truth has moved towards public opinion and everyone has their own truth and it's no longer found in the Bible. So here's the big statement. We are no longer a Christian culture. We live in a polarized, divided culture that no longer values the Bible as truth but instead finds truth in public perception and opinion. The reality is, is culturally, we have no anchor. The majority of Christians, if they believe in God, they do not believe, uh, sorry, the, the majority of Americans, if they believe in God, do not believe in the God of the Bible. Instead, they believe God should come out as a therapist, help them when they want something, and then disappear and leave them to do whatever they want. This is pre-COVID stats. This report came out weeks before COVID hit in 2020. What about leadership? Pause for a second and consider how do you think pastors are doing? Ministers are leaving the ministry in massive numbers, 1,500 a month. 
29% of pastors are considering leaving the ministry right now. 90% of ministers will not reach retirement as a paid minister. I could give you all sorts of crazy stats about how ministers and pastors are, are burnt out, they're discouraged, and they do not know how to lead during the pandemic to deal with this polarized culture. That is ungracious. Furthermore, we've seen a sharp decline in young people going into the ministry. Less and less young people want to serve the church vocationally. Now, I don't tell you all of this as a scare tactic. I pray that it becomes a splash of cold water that kind of awakens us and tells us to get ready. Because easy Christianity is fading away. Where God is kind of like a, an option in the Luby's line where we choose whether we want to pick him up today or not, that is fading away. The reality is the church must know who it is in Jesus and find its footing outside of cultural acceptance. Now, that should come as no surprise, right? Because Christ is king. Because Christ is, is seated, ruling on his throne, and he disciplines his church and draws us to him. Okay? If you see this from the cultural lens, it can be very scary. And you can panic, and you can be filled with fear, and you can say, ah, what's going to happen? But in reality, you should never view things that way. You should view it as Christ is pruning his church. Christ is drawing his church to himself. Christ is demanding of us that we would love him more and more and more. And here's the deal. As you will see with what takes place in the international church, right, that when when persecution or difficulty, when hard times come in, the reality is you get more of Christ. You will depend upon him more. You will fall more in love with him. Your heart will yearn for him because things will be weeded out of your life. Things that you, that you were holding on to that you just say, take them, use them, Lord. I just want you. So what do we need we need a multi-generational church that is committed to discipleship. It is time for depth and seriousness because harder times are coming. Persecution is coming. Here's the deal. Older generation, you have been refined by trials you have a perseverance that the younger generation needs because there's a seriousness about when we gather together. We must shift away from preference-driven church. And if there's one thing we would say about the, skate, the, the landscape of the American church and culture and of Christianity, it is that we're so preference-driven Church is defined by music and preference, and I like that. I didn't like that sermon. I'm going to go over here and that sort of thing. Like, like, like you can shop around for this long, and then at some point, like, get in, get committed, and we cannot be preference-driven. We must, we must create deep, meaningful relationships of discipleship within the church. It's what we need. Also, we need more young people called into the ministry, we will know that God is doing a work amongst us when our sons and daughters give their life away for ministry and missions. I know that God is with us and is moving amongst us. And that First Baptist Bernie is going to be a light, first for our multi-generational discipleship, but guys, also because we are uniquely positioned to be able to shine good works and gain the ear of our culture so that we can tell them about Jesus. Let me state it this way. Do you know what our culture desires deeply? Good works. And what I mean by that, our culture 
greatly desires right now, more than ever before, caring for the disadvantaged, the poor, and the vulnerable. Now, that whole thing has become so politicized, but here's the deal. Our culture desires that, and that's exactly what the Bible tells us to do. That's Jesus' heart. But here's the deal. Our culture does not have the character to actually do those hard works, okay? What you see rising up in the culture right now, they may esteem the idea of we should care for the poor, we should give justice, we should do all of those things. But are they spending less money on their clothes? Less time playing video games? Are they doing hard work and getting their hands dirty and really being sacrificial? No. But guys, that's our calling. Let your good works shine before men so that they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's our calling out of Matthew 5. And here's the deal. This is why I love First Baptist Bernie. This is our culture. This is our heritage. God has called us to be a church that reaches out into the needs of our community. We have long established ministries that already do this. This is what we do with Meadowlands or Take It to the Street or Grace House. It's why over this this fall semester, we told you to bless a local mission partner. In fact, there's one urgent need that that I need to make you aware of right now. That is, our foster care system in Texas is an absolute disaster. It's like a real mess. And even here in our region, in San Antonio and in Kendall County, overrun with need, 1,200 children have no hope of returning to their family and are waiting to be adopted. More than 1,600 children have to be placed outside of our county because there are not enough foster care homes. And the statistics about how difficult foster care is, uh, half of them quit within the first year. Now, foster care is not for everyone, but there are ways that all of us can help, okay? By donating your time, supplies, et cetera. In fact, if you want to know more, we have a free lunch today in the hub Uh, where Rachel Russo and some others are going to talk about what we can be doing as a church to help in this crisis. All right, now let's shift and let's ask the question, what's taking place internationally? So we can clearly see what's taking place here at home within Christianity, but is there good news globally? I want you to look first at this map of evangelicals in 2020. I want to call your attention so the lightest colors are the least evangelical. First, I want you to look at Europe. Of what was once the hubbed of evangelicalism, Protestantism is now almost non-existent. But now I want you to look at Brazil and Africa. Check out this next graph. Because I want you to notice, even though we know that this shift is declining, that evangel- that the gospel, as far as believers, is declining in the United States and in Europe, the gospel is exploding in large pockets in South Africa, Asia, and China. Sorry, South America as well. So what we see and what we know and understand is that there is a global shift of the center of Christianity. It's moving south and east. And this is a good thing. Obviously not that we are declining, but it is a good thing. Because for 200 years, the United States has been the leading exporter of missionaries. But over the past 30 years, South Korea, Brazil, India, they are catching up quickly by sending out more and more and more missionaries. What it means is they are able to go into areas and regions of the, of the earth that we cannot. That's a good thing. Here's the other thing I want you to think about. Like Thursday, 
was Veterans Day, where we pause to honor the sacrifices of previous generations of those who've served. Catch this, because I hadn't had this thought till earlier this week. South Korea is one of the leading countries in the entire world that sends out missionaries. There was a war that was fought decades ago that was very unpopular. But guess what? It was worth it. Because the gospel is going forward. God is using it. So as the gospel explodes in these regions, here's the deal. What we know is they are in desperate need of good resources and education. Okay, The gospel is going into difficult areas, as you will see, and they are in desperate need of training and education and resources, which is why I love our partnerships at First Baptist Bernie. That we have partnerships in Africa and Moldova that have schools and seminaries that train pastors and church planters. Because we are doing this. We've been doing it for 20 years. So let's dive a little deeper into this growth, into the gospel explosion that you see. Because we are seeing it in the same places as intense persecution. The 20th century was the bloodiest century in the history of the world, and especially for Christian martyrs. There were more Christians murdered in the, uh, in the 20th century than in the previous 19th centuries combined. Now, it's difficult to get current day martyrdom numbers. You could imagine because of North Korea, China, ex Islam extremism, they're not really keeping a good tally for us. But some would estimate close to 100,000 Christians are martyred a year. Now consider what's happening with persecution after COVID. Because when, limit, when resources are limited in hostile areas, right, they don't get aid, you don't get medical help, and if they can, they'll steal your stuff. So let me highlight two areas. The first is Nigeria. Nigeria has had an explosion of evangelical growth over the last 50 years. We've seen 28% growth from 21% of the population to 49%. Okay, So not only is it going with population increase, more than a fourth of the population has come to faith in Jesus Christ. There are now 75 million Christians in Nigeria. Only can be described as an awakening of God. But it's also the number one spot in the entire world for martyrdom. More Christians are killed there than in any other spot. In one city, just over the past eight months, 600 Christians were killed. And in fact, this, this weekend, yesterday, I got an update on my phone from an Open Doors app that Emmanuel Baptist Church was raided and 60 Christians were, are, were abducted and are now being held hostage. Yet, in the midst of abductions, murders, churches destroyed, the gospel is going forward. In fact, get this. In the top 50 most persecuted countries, right, the worst places on the planet to be a Christian, last year, 50 million new Christians 50 million last year in the hardest spots on the planet. Another incredible story is of the country of Iran. Because in 1979, the hardline Islamic State came in. And at that time, there were only 500 Christians in the entire nation. A nation of 38 million, only 500 Christians. And the state sought to completely stamp them out. Missionaries were kicked out. Evangelism was outlawed. Bibles were banned. And pastors were killed. Iran right now is an extreme persecution area. Number eight on the list. What do you think happened with those 500? More Iranians came to Christ in the last 20 years than had in the previous 13 centuries combined. It is the fastest growing evangelical church in the world. 
There are close to one million Christians there in Iran today. And do you know where the second fastest growing evangelical church is in the entire world? Afghanistan. Because, catch this, the Iranians have a similar dialect and are evangelizing them. I know there were so many veterans around here just several months ago who were absolutely heartbroken because after 20 years you saw ISIS, or you saw what took place in Afghanistan and you asked the question, was it worth it? Is it worth it? Here's the deal. Jesus Christ reigns and the gospel goes forward. The gospel goes forward. This is God's story. He is writing it. There are limited resources, limited Bibles, even limited missionaries. And he is using signs and wonders. People are talking about having dreams about this man in white and then meeting someone who tells them that is Jesus. And believers are stepping out with boldness for they did not love their lives even when faced with death. Here's the one truth you must understand. Beloved, the gospel is going to the ends of the earth. And praise God, we get to be a part. Guys, we get to be a part. Check out our mission partners and how they are strategically placed across the world and into these difficult areas. Mongolia, India, Moldova, Russia, Kenya, Uganda, Germany, Mexico, Peru. We together, collectively, will give more than half a million dollars to missions this year. Just like the shortage of pastors, there's a decline in our sons and daughters going. Here's the deal. We need missionaries. And we want to see a movement right here where God calls more of our sons and daughters. And we want to continue to provide Christian education and training to pastors in these difficult areas of need. And God has called people from within our midst and called them to go out. Praise God for that. Let me tell you about one story of Hannah Powell, who grew up Monroe, right here at First Baptist. She was one of our longtime mission partners. She went to Sam Houston State, felt uh, like Jessica Simpson uh, was one of our mission partners. She felt called to, to go to Huntsville and to, uh, and to just be used of the Lord in, in uh, college ministry. But there she met her husband, Matt, and so she's now uh, uh, Matt and Hannah Powell. And it was a short time later, even after three kids, where they felt the Lord calling them to go plant churches among the unreached in North Africa. Think about that calling. As they began to mobilize and gain their support and figure out how, how they were going to get there, obviously resources and, and money was needed, and uh, they, they reached out to First Baptist. And here's an incredible story from, from a, a mission night where, where they were just meeting together as a committee as they were talking about the POWs and have a huge desire to go plant churches in these incredible difficult areas. And, and the church was saying, well, well they, they, need, they have to need some money. And so the, uh, the committee threw out a number that said, well, well we, have, we have this much set aside. And, and then they sent a quick text message to Hannah and said, how much do you need to get you to the finish line? And it was that exact amount. Oh, wow. You just pause and you praise God and you say, yes, God, yes, we will go. Yes, we will go. So I've, I've given us a, a quick, a, I mean, a super quick flyover about what takes place nationally and internationally. And, and here's the deal. There, when you're in the midst of, of trial and difficulty, when, when these things are being stirred up, oftentimes the, the image and, and the response can be one of fear. But I, want you, I need you to understand what takes place in the book of Revelation. Because as the, 
the lamb is opening the seals. And, and you see, these things are coming. These things are coming. They should not surprise us. This world is not our home. These things are coming. There is an interlude that takes place in Revelation chapter 7. And that interlude, there are two signs that are given. And those signs are given in order to stir up courage and faith within the saints. That says, yes, yes, you, you may not know. And the unfolding of what takes place may scare you to death. But listen to me, church. I've got you. Those two signs, the first of which God seals his people. He stamps them with a seal on his forehead. That is for God to declare, this one is mine. The way the seal works in the book of Revelation is Satan seals all of his and God seals all of his. Rest assured, if he is your Lord and Savior, if you have placed your faith in him, he has sealed you. And you know what that means? It means no trial is ever wasted. No trial is ever wasted that his promises towards you are unfailing. He has promised to cause all things to work, to, uh, all things work together for the good for those who love him and are called. He has sealed you and he has promised all things work together for the good. And the second sign that he gives there in the book of Revelation as encouragement for the saints as the seals are unfolding, as it gets scary is you get to see a picture of the end. There is a great multitude from every tribe, tongue, and nation gathered around the throne praising King Jesus. And you get to just pause and see that image. Because you may look at the state of the church nationally and internationally. You may be filled with fear. But when you see the image of the end, you understand two things. One, the gospel goes to the ends of the earth. You know how it ends. Every tribe, tongue, and nation. It cannot be stopped. It cannot be thwarted. Think about this. In Iran, when it was supposed to be smashed out, the gospel goes forward. In Afghanistan, where we think we have so much despair, the gospel will go forward. There will be those declaring Jesus is king, praising him with all that he is. Amen. Amen. It should stir up your faith and confidence. But secondly, it should give you a picture of what home is. That's your home. And that's where you will rest and that's where we will store up treasure. And that's where all of our delight will be. All of it there with him. All of it there with him. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, we love you. We are so short-sighted. Jesus, we cannot see past the end of our nose. Yeah, we can open your word and you can unfold riches and wisdom and truth, understanding. Help us to trust you. We are such an anxious culture. It is such a time for believers to be rooted and grounded that you are on your throne, that you are in control that your gospel will go to the ends of the earth. And in you is our rest. Help us to be that light as a church. Help us to invest our resources. Help us to gain an ear with our community because we shine our good works as with your heart, we reach out to those who are in desperate, desperate need. We want your name to be high and lifted up, King Jesus. You and you alone. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.